WikiLeaks, which we all know about, has suddenly changed the world for politicians. In, uh, in the era before WikiLeaks, when a politician wanted to say something, they really could just about say anything. And then when somebody said, I need some substantiation for that, they would say, oh, well, of course, we'd love to give you the substantiation, but the problem is, is that national security. And if only you knew what we had, then, but we can't do that. So now, um, now that doesn't work anymore. And the same thing has happened recently in the past couple of weeks with the NGO sector, uh, which I work in. And for those of us who work in war zones, uh, the recent scandal that has rocked the, uh, rocked the newspapers has made life difficult. I had prepared a talk, for instance, um, on how I had saved an African village uh, from a dragon eating the entire uh, village. But um, I've had to scrap that because you wouldn't believe it. So instead, uh, as this is TEDx East, I'm going to try something new. And for the first time, I, as the head uh, of an NGO working in a war zone, are going to tell you the true story of what actually inspires me uh, to do the work that I do. So, what do I do? Well, I work in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. In fact, if I got any more east, I would be in Rwanda. So, um, I work there, and what I do there is I employ about over a thousand people in growing crops. And so, uh, we grow all kinds of things like rice and corn and beans and, and tons of different types of, of food. Uh, and as we employ a thousand people doing it, it makes us the largest employer in the province, but also the largest producer of food. So, we have a, quite a bit to do. Uh, however, as you could imagine um, by my accent, I'm not actually from Congo. I am, in fact, from Maine. That's right, Maine. Um, and where in Maine, like all Mainers, I live a charmed life of ease and luxury. <laughs> now the question, the vexed question that you must be asking yourself at this point is, why does somebody from Maine decide to leave the lovely land of Maine and go to war-torn Congo, where, as we all know, <laughs> it is a land full of, of many, many dangers and, and, and terrible things? Um, and now, traditionally, in the pre-scandal era, I would have had to tell you about the first time I ever went to Africa, and the first time I arrived in Congo and saw the, the desperate poverty and despair of the area, and of course, the children. We can't forget the children. However, to quote my uh, beloved grandmother, Pat Traub here, mother of six and grandmother of about 30, I hate children. <laughs> So if, that's not, if it's not the children, then what am I doing there? And the answer is sadly, um, probably like many of you, the reason that I'm in Africa is that my mother made me do it. <laughs> this is my mother. Here's a close-up of her in her backyard. Here's her standing next to a Viking in Iceland. Here's her hiding behind a couch with her mother, Pat Traub. And here's her milking a cow which coincidentally actually has a, a big deal to do with my uh, early influences as a child because I grew up on a dairy farm. That's me there sitting on the cow, actually. That's my sister right next to me. Um, and, uh, and that was a big influence on me, growing up on a dairy farm as a child. However, uh, she also had another huge influence on me, and that was, like all of you, I was actually born not knowing how to read. However, unlike many of you, uh, I didn't learn to read until seventh and eighth grade. And so, uh, as a result, any access to the world of great literature out there, uh, I had to get through my mother. And whereas I wanted her to read me lovely books like Treasure Island and Kidnapped and the Horatio Hornblower series and the complete and unabridged works of His Holiness J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, she had other ideas, more interesting books that she wanted to read me, books like essays in Gandhian economics. Small is beautiful. The first industrial revolution, a concise economic history of the world, and that book that all young men dream of hearing read to them as a child. Emmanuel Wallerstein's The Modern World System, Capitalist Agriculture and the Origin of the European World Economy in the 16th Century. So what more natural that I would take uh, my my newfound ideas 
from the reading that my mother had been giving to me and combine them my, with my real world uh, experience and say, you know what? You don't have to be poor or retired to live in, in the country. And so I said, what I want to do with my life is find a way to get rural people out of poverty. And for 60 years, economists have tried to do that with a very clever scenario of uh, deporting everybody who lives in the countryside and importing a bunch of people from the city who've made a lot of money. And that's how they can raise wage levels in the, in, in the poor areas, uh, in the rural areas. However, uh, I, I wanted to come up with another idea and realized that if I was going to do that, I had to have some real solid grasp on economics. So I needed to go to school and become an economist. And the only problem with that was that uh, my grades weren't quite, uh, weren't quite quite, I guess you would say, not knowing how to read until eighth grade. Uh, and so I needed a school that would appreciate my true genius without quibbling about things like grades and SAT scores. Um, and so I found such a uh, forward-thinking school in Hampshire College. And, uh, and I see some people here anticipated that great school uh, <laughs> when given the qualifications. So, um, so Hampshire College, uh, and while at Hampshire, I see you hear you say, okay, very clever. Uh, we have economics, we have, um, we have, uh, we have uh, agriculture, but, but, uh, but where does this coming into Africa come in? Well, now here's the hard truth, is that while at Hampshire, like so many uh, of my peers, I was introduced to a small Swedish company uh, which manufactures um, computer games called Paradox. And Paradox doesn't make the first person shooter games that you know, they make games like Europa Universalis 2 and Victoria and Empire Under the Sun. Uh, games in which you don't have uh, the direct action, it's more something that focuses on history and political intrigue and uh, economic micromanagement that would make most people tear their hair out or not buy the game, which is <laughs> which is exactly what happened. But I did play this game, and it was a brilliant game because it also let me play as my ancestors. In short, I was hooked. Um, and so I said, okay, this is all fun, fun, fun to do, but I don't wanna just be playing video games and living in an alternative reality. I wanna be doing this in real life. I wanna take these skills that I'm learning from Paradox and Hampshire and, and my mother and, and sort of put them in some sort of uh, Better, better case scenario. And what, well, let me, let me just oversimplify the world here and come up with one of those, uh, one of those analogies as in those two types of people. You know, you know the ones, the uh, two types of people. In the road of life, there are drivers and there are people who get run off the road. Um, I, I've come up with one myself, which is that um, in life, there are people who, who, who have a day job and play music on the side and then there are rock stars. And I had absolutely no interest in being a, a casual gamer. I wanted to go for the glory. Um, I wanted to create systems in which thousands of people uh, were thriving in economic structures that I had built from the ground up. And so why Africa? Well, why Congo in particular is more the point because in the world today, there's not that many people who would give this guy control of their economy. In fact, the only people who would give somebody like me uh, a chance to influence their economy are people who don't have one. Um, and so the truth is when I first came to uh, the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo and saw the mass poverty and, and, and destruction and complete emptiness, uh, I, I wasn't struck with a feeling of pity and uh, uh, of sorrow and, and what might have been. I was, uh, I was quite a bit hungry from not having eaten for a little while, but I, the main feeling that I had was one of excitement because what I saw was an ability to build the type of world uh, that I had been reading about all this time. Where I saw this empty plain, I would, see, uh, I would see buildings, I would see fields, I would see irrigation canals and roads and, and, and various agricultural buildings and structures. And then to see all that take place over the course of the past five years has been what motivates me. So I guess to conclude, I'd say it's not, it's not what I've done, it's not what I've built that inspires me to keep, uh, to keep going to work and to keep working in this environment. What it is is seeing what I plan to do 
materialize. Thank you.